Oops. Okay, let's get started, but we're going to make sure everybody is muted, which they all should be, but of course, no technology is perfect. Um, so I think my colleagues will go ahead and handle that and we can kick this off. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for signing up to attend today's event. We're going to do uh, an in-depth look at the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, specifically through a rural lens. I just want to start by thanking the State Strategic Growth Council and the Department of Housing and Community Development for sponsoring today's event. And we really hope you're able to walk away today with a more comprehensive understanding of the program, how to craft a competitive application, um, and a better understand, understanding of the, the challenges and the opportunities rural communities face when you're looking to secure affordable housing and sustainable community program funds. My name is Christine Williams, and along with my colleague Alicia Sebastian, I'll be one of your presenters today. So I will introduce a bit more about myself in a moment and my organization, but do want to start with just some quick housekeeping items and a walkthrough of today's agenda. So starting with housekeeping, um, all of you should have been muted upon entry. If you have questions, you are welcome to enter them directly into the chat and I'll review in a moment how to access that if you haven't already. We do have technical assistance team members on hand who are going to be monitoring the chat and they will be working to respond to your questions as they come up. If your questions are broader in nature or are gonna require some time to respond, we're gonna bump them to either the end of this presentation if we have time to sort of, you know, put our collective heads together and troubleshoot them. If we are not able to answer any of your questions right now, know that in our follow-up, we are going to be taking all of the questions submitted today and sending them out with responses as part of sort of a, an event FAQ, so to speak. And we'll be sending that out as well with a recording of this presentation, as well as some copies of the PowerPoint slides. So rest assured there, you'll be getting all the content. Um, I'm gonna to start today's presentation by just introducing the technical assistance team uh, who have spent much of their time helping develop this content. We'll then go ahead and do a general overview of the ASIC or AHSC program more generally, moving into a, a focused look at scoring and best practices. And then we'll again wrap up with next steps and some Q&A as time allows. Okay, so if you haven't yet figured out how to access the chat, I will say if you go to the top of your screen, you're gonna to wanna to click exit. I think it says something like full, full screen mode or something like that. That will allow you to go then to the bottom of your screen and find this little chat icon um, in the center. You're gonna click that. Your chat should open up on the right side of your screen. All right. Okay, and then did want to note that, um, oh, I'm too quick there, did want to note that today's webinar is one of a multi-part series. So some of you may have joined us earlier this week on Tuesday for a, a general 101 reviewing the program. We're doing the Rural Innovation Project Area RIPA webinar today. But there are some upcoming webinars as well. All are free and accessible. We will send out additional information about these events that you can sign up for, again, as part of the follow-up. All right, well, let's start with who is talking to you out of your computer screens. Um, so each year, the Strategic Growth Council has contracted with technical assistance providers across the state to offer focused TA to qualified applicants interested in submitting applications. In our most recent round of funding, round five, there were 34 total projects that received TA assistance. Of those 34 projects, 23 of them wound up submitting full applications. Award recommendations are going to come in June, so we don't not yet know how these applications fared, but we like to think we're a good value add uh, and can help you you know, considerably increase the competitiveness, competitiveness of your scope. So this slide represents the round five TA team. 
um, you know, we're comprised of both programmatic and specialist experts who are available to work directly with you throughout the entire application process. And as I mentioned, my name is Christine. I represent Enterprise Community Partners. We are a national nonprofit organization focused explicitly on affordable housing. Um, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Alicia Sebastian with the California Coalition for Rural Housing. I'm gonna turn it over to her to introduce herself, her organization, and talk a little bit about how this program defines rural communities. Thanks so much, Christine, and thanks to everybody who's uh, on the webinar with me today. Um, as Christine mentioned, I'm with the California Coalition for Rural Housing. We're the oldest statewide affordable housing advocacy organization in the United States. We're based in Sacramento. We work statewide. We do research, technical assistance, um, and advocacy, uh, representing and serving farm worker, American Indian tribal, and rural communities across California. That's our focus. It does bring us into a lot of really exciting spaces, and we've been working with the HSC program since it began. Along uh, with me today is my colleague, Vanessa. Vanessa is going to be, you'll see her alongside Enterprise staff in the chat for you. So if you have some rural specific questions, you're gonna go ahead and you'll see Vanessa and myself responding as we go. So we're gonna go ahead and take a minute right now to talk about specifically what we mean by rural in the context of the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. So AHSC, um, and you'll also notice some folks say ASIC, some of us say AHSC, clearly I'm right, but there is not technically a wrong way to say this. So AHSC uses the same definition of rural as the Tax Credit Allocation Committee. So if you are doing affordable housing development and you've done a LIHTC application, then you are familiar with this methodology. For those of you who are not, it's listed here. You're either a non, you have to be one of the three following. A non-metropolitan county. You know yourself if you are there on that list. You could also be a USDA Rural Housing Service eligible. And that is, there's a link for it here. Um, it changes regularly as USDA updates their definitions and terms. And then there's also a small city status, which gets a little bit more confusing. This is where you're located in an unincorporated city with a population of less than 40,000 people, where you're adjacent to one and your census tract is not desi designated as urban. So what this basically says is that the definition of rural is down at your address of your project level. Because it has to do with census tracts and census tracts can divide a street or a block, um, it can get a little complicated. Uh, CCRH and the other technical assistance providers on this um, team are available to help you alongside the treasurer's office in determining whether or not you are qualified as rural within HSC. If you're on this webinar and you're taking a look at this slide and you're realizing, oh goodness, we're not rural, don't hang up, don't hop off, stay right where you are because the most of the slides that we're going to be going over today are applicable whether you are an urban area or a rural area. And the specific rural context that we're going to be bringing to this conversation also applies to a lot of these smaller communities that aren't technically rural but are maybe more rural in nature or are not our typical urban centers. So this is what we mean when we say rural, we're just gonna to refer to it as rural as we move forward, but don't leave if you're not under one of these categories. Excellent. Thank you, Alicia. Um, so now that we're all busily figuring out exactly how we qualify, um, well, let's go ahead and take a step back and talk a little bit about where this program originates. Um, so ASIC is one of California's many cap and trade programs, what we refer to as California Climate Investment Programs. And it receives revenue from auctions that are held quarterly where pollution allowances are purchased. The revenue that's generated from those allowances is then funneled into the various CCI programs. And there are three kind of categories of CCI programs. ASIC falls into the sustainable communities and clean transportation bucket. We think it's important that you have this background because ultimately at its core, the ASIC program is a greenhouse gas reduction program. And it is this before it is even a housing or a transportation program. This program funds projects that ultimately are designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And it does that primarily by reducing vehicle miles traveled. 
so we find that if you if you keep that GHG reduction, you know, premise as sort of your guiding light when you're working on scoping for an application, you can have an easier time sort of wrapping your head around everything that's required um, as part of an A6 submittal. In addition to reducing those greenhouse gases, ASIC also has other priority goals. Uh, you know, we characterize this program as one that has impacts that extend beyond just the housing parcel. Some of those additional goals include reducing single passenger vehicle use through the provision of other low carbon transportation options. ASIC is also a program that's really heavy on connectivity. So how can you connect your housing to jobs and other key destinations, again, through sustainable transportation options like transit, walking, and biking. And then continuing on with goals, um, as part of this program statutory mandate, investment needs to be directed into what are termed disadvantaged communities. We will define what we mean when we're using that term later on. Um, there's also various associated co-benefits associated with this program. So looking at workforce development, anti-displacement measures, public health, um, of course, building infill housing, all of these additional goals um, are things that are met through successful ASIC applications. Okay, so we've done like a broad overview of the intent of the program. How do you do that? What does ASIC actually fund for you to reduce those vehicle miles traveled and achieve those GHG reductions. So here's a list of eligible capital project buckets that you could use ASIC dollars to fund. Funds for housing, specifically affordable housing, are broken out into two categories. You have funds in the form of a loan for your affordable housing development. And then there's a cost category that we refer to as HRI or housing related infrastructure. This category covers any infrastructure costs that are required explicitly by a locality as a specific condition of approval for the housing development itself. So I always use an example. I worked with a project that needed to relocate a, a storm drain line that was running under the street. The housing project itself was contingent upon the developer being able to do that in order for the locality to approve the housing project. So you can't just sort of willy-nilly put items in the HRI category. And HRI funds come in the form of a grant. Next, we have what we refer to as STIs, or Sustainable Transportation Infrastructure. These are actual capital improvements, sidewalks, bike lanes, transit capital items that, ex that facilitate mode shift. So they allow people to directly utilize them for transportation needs versus using a car. I also want to flag that new in round five, transit operations for up to two years can also be funded through this program. These STI costs, usually because you know, they're, they fall within the public right of way, um, are typically, not always, but typically managed by a public agency. Next up, we have TRAs or transit related amenities. So I describe these items as ones that enhance the use of those STI items, things like street trees, bus shelters, bike parking, et cetera. Again, these are usually scoped and sort of managed by a public agency partner. And then finally, we have programs. You can see there are three categories here. ASIC will fund operating expenses expenses for programs that fall under these three categories for up to three years, not to exceed $500,000. And um, programs are, can be pretty broad. They can be developer managed. We've worked with metropolitan planning organizations, public agencies, community groups. Um, there's a lot of options in terms of scoping your programs. Here are some eligible cost examples. This is specific to, again, those STI, sustainable transportation infrastructure cost items. So new and improved bikeways, sidewalks, pedestrian um, crossings, traffic calming projects. We've seen bus rapid transit infrastructure go in, um, you know, the purchase of new transit vehicles to expand existing transit service or increase it. And again, the transit operations you can fund for up to two years. 
same thing. Let's look at some examples of TRA, transportation related amenities. Again, streetscape improvements, lighting, signage, um, pedestrian amenities, street furniture. This includes bus shelters, various kinds of bike infrastructure, urban greening um, is a good one we see a lot. And then explicitly improvements made at either transit stations or stops. And finally, here are some example of eligible program costs. So we see um, occasionally bike and pedestrian safety classes being offered to affordable housing residents or to the community, community transit pass programs, air pollution exposure mitigation programs, various programs that deal with workforce development and car share programs are also eligible. All right. So how much money is available to fund all of these great things? Um, in round five, there was a $30 million maximum per award amount. There is a minimum $1 million request the program has. So I will say you will likely be much above that $1 million. So you can see the average request across all submitted applications in round five was $22 million. Rural projects, historically come in a little bit below the average. So for round five, we were looking at $18 million for the average rural project. Of those award amounts, what does the actual fund breakout look like? So you can see here, this is not specific to rural. Again, this is all submitted projects in this most recent round. Um, housing makes up the bulk of the request, right? So we're seeing about you know, a little less than 70% of the, the average ASIC ask is going towards housing. You do need to make sure that um, at least half of your funding request is going to housing, but we don't typically see anyone having trouble meeting that minimum. Then we have the transportation. So that's those STI and those TRA items coming in around a little above 30%. Um, there is a $10 million cap on those items that you cannot exceed. But again, we didn't see too many issues with people running you know, into that, that cap amount. And then programs make up considerably less, generally about 1% of your funding request. All right, now I'm gonna turn it over to Alicia to talk about how ASIC differentiates between what it calls project area types. Thanks so much, Christine. And we'll go ahead and get into this um, on the next couple of slides. We'll go a little bit deeper on everything you see here. But one, we'll just start with transit-oriented development, or TOD. And you'll say, but wait, Alicia, aren't all of these projects TOD? We do lots of TOD. Yes, but in AHSC, TOD refers to a very specific project type. And these are your most urbanized areas. And we'll go into specifically what that looks like. You also have integrated connectivity projects, or ICP. So these are often the same communities um, and jurisdictions as a TOD with a difference in um, the actual transit available. And then we have a Rural Innovation Project Area, or RIPA. These are just like ICT projects, but located specifically in a rural area. We will go step by step into what you're seeing here, which is the transit requirements as well as the set aside. Next slide, please, Christine. So let's look at these. These are defined, um, so project area types are defined largely by the level of transit that serves that, that specific project site. So remember, you're going to identify a site for your project, and that is what will determine whether you are TOD, ICP, or RIPA. Within TOD, what we're looking for is high quality transit and a 15 minute frequency. And so what we mean by high quality transit is specifically rail service, like a BART, um, and or um, a trolley system, and then, and or a dedicated infrastructure for bus rapid transit. So what you're looking there for here is specifically a level of in transit infrastructure. ICP or integrated connectivity project cannot have that high quality transit. It cannot have the dedicated BRT or rail service. It um, has instead uh, other transit service that departs at two times during peak hours. What this means is that a community could qualify, a jurisdiction could have both a TOD site and or an ICT site. A RIPA project looks just like ICP, but it has to be located in one of these rural areas. 
Christine, is there anything you wanted to add before we move on from transit? Just that we will dive into kind of some more definitions of um, what this, what we define qualifying transit um, in a later slide. So if you're a little hung up on that, don't worry, we're going to get to it. Yeah, especially how it relates to um, the Ripper project area. So we will do a deep dive after this. So there are project area set asides, in which case a certain portion of the awards um, or the total funding available within the program are targeted for. Um, Four, three, seven, three, one, five, eight. Okay. Hello. Thirty-five. Please, yeah. Please <laughs> just <laughs> mute yourself. You should all be muted, but Zoom is not perfect. So um, thanks. So 35% of all of the projects of the program funds are targeted for transit oriented development. 45% of program funds are now set aside for ICT. Uh, this came through a lot of advocacy and partnership with HCD and SGC because um, we recognize that the majority of projects moving through this program fall under the ICT project area type. Um, and so we were able to advocate and partner to increase uh, up to 45% of program funds available for this project area type. Also through advocacy and partnership, we've been able to set aside 10% of all program funds specifically for rural projects. There have been additional projects funded outside of that 10% set aside, but a minimum of 10% of all program um, awards will go to a rural project. The next threshold um, that relates to project area type is the net density. We will talk more about how net density is calculated, but in order to compete in POD, your threshold, just to play the game, is 30 units to the acre. For ICP, that's 20 units to the acre. And for rural areas, that is 15 units to the acre. Everyone from a rural community, take a deep breath. We, we got this. That being said, again, another deep breath in you rural folks, uh, the average density in round five applications um, and what we are seeing in order, again, to really compete. So the threshold is what it takes to get your project considered in the program. In order to really win those awards, we are seeing an average of 180 units to the acre for transit oriented development. We are seeing an average of 58 units to the acre for an ICP. And again, deep breath with me, rural folks, we are seeing 20 units to the acre for a competitive rural project. We'll talk more about this, but it is possible and we are doing it. Next slide, please, Christine, unless there's anything you want to add. No, I think that covered it. Okay, so, so we noted that earlier, the program seeks to direct funding into disadvantaged communities. So similar to the project area type set aside, there are set asides explicit uh, for disadvantaged communities or another fun acronym for everyone to remember what we call DACs. Um, there is a programmatic requirement that at least 50% of all ASIC award funding go toward projects that are identified as being in a DAC. These are communities identified at the census tract level through a state tool called Cal Screen. If you are not familiar with that tool, Cal Screen produces a percentile score that's based on a combination of various socioeconomic and environmental factors. So things like poverty, housing need, asthma rate, particulate pollution, et cetera. If your project falls within a census tract that scores in the top 25% of the index, so anything at 75 or above, you are in a DAC. I do want to stress that while DAC communities are important, um, if you are outside of a DAC, it is not a reason to think you aren't competitive or eligible to apply. We routinely see projects outside of DACs that are awarded each year. So again, if you're looking at this map and you're like, whoa, I'm way up in the North State or over in the Sierra Foothills, um, don't tune out. You can certainly um, be eligible and competitive. And then in round five, there was, um, I don't know that I would characterize it as a set aside, but there was an intent to fund um, at least one project from a federally recognized tribe. 
Um, and we did see our first tribal application submittal. So that was very exciting. Um, and I know the state, I think, has plans to sort of continue this focus as we move through the rounds. Okay, now we're going to dig into threshold requirements um, that need to be in place in order for you to be eligible to submit an application for the upcoming round. This is not a comprehensive list, but it does include items oops, we run up against most frequently that can be make or break it. The first is making sure you either have or will have qualifying transit. So qualifying transit, as Alicia mentioned, one is a transit station or stop that needs to be within a half mile from your housing site and that has service that departs at least two or more times during peak hours as defined by a transit agency. We recognize that this threshold is hard to meet for many rural applicants. And so the program also allows for what it refers to as flexible transit to qualify. Flexible transit has one, flexible routing. It also has shared ride vehicles that have at least two passengers at any given time. It can include van pool, shuttle, and bus feeder systems. It does not include dial a ride. If you're, you know, kind of like, whoa, I don't have either qualifying or flexible transit in place currently, you can use ASICs to bring it to your housing site. This always raises a ton of questions. So just know that Alicia and myself, um, we're going to bring it up again in a few slides. We're also available to talk you through it more directly. Okay, moving on. I do want to. I did want to, yeah. Christine, I did want to hop in real quick just because we have a question coming through on the chat that I think would apply real quick here. And we sure. will talk more about it, but again, for the qualifying transit, it has to be in place at the time of application. We'll talk more about planned transit and what that looks like, but your qualifying transit is in place at the time of application. What? I know we have folks from SGC. Will you confirm. I think in some cases we've had qualifying transit proposed and it needs to be in place by the time the housing site is up. But right, we will check that. Okay. Um, lots of questions on transit always. We are here for that. Um, okay. Moving along here. So uh, also, as Alicia mentioned, at the time of application, which for this next round is going to be February 2021, you need to have at least 90% of your total development costs committed. That sounds like a lot, and it is. But keep in mind, you are able to count the financing you'd be bringing in through the 4% tax credit program. I'm going to ask somebody's unmuted, if you can mute yourself. So you can count the financing you'd be bringing in through the 4% tax credit program. This program is intended to be paired with 4% credits and not the 9% program. And you can count your ASIC funding request. Sorry about that. Second, um, in terms of environmental approvals and entitlements, um, you do need to have CEQA and or NEPA if required completed again at the time of application. So that's that February 2021 okay, deadline for your housing site. Transportation projects are not held to that by application deadline schedule. Um, that they typically need to have their environmental clearances in hand by grant disbursal, which is usually fall of the funding year. So that would be fall 2021. You need all entitlements and land use approvals, excluding design review, also complete by February 2021 for the upcoming round. You need to have site control by February 2021. You also cannot have an average AMI above 50%. So area median income cannot exceed 50% for all units you're requesting ASIC funding for. And in addition, um, there's been a a previous threshold item that you need to provide at least one transit pass per subsidized unit for at least three years. You have been able to use ASIC funds to pay for this. And then Alicia will talk about this more in a minute, but you also need to be in a jurisdiction that has a compliant housing element. 
Each application must also contain two distinct urban greening projects as part of its scope. Again, those can fit in that TRA category. And just keep in mind that your project financing needs to comply with standard HCD underwriting criteria. Now, there's a lot of information. Um, again, it's not a comprehensive list. We have a comprehensive list. We're happy to share with you if you have questions. Now, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia to talk about some um, just highlight some rural specific threshold considerations. Thanks, Christine. And we will be again kind of going through these topics. So the things that um, are in particular a challenge for rural communities or maybe some of our smaller communities that aren't quite rural is the density requirement at 15 units to the acre and specifically how density is quantified. Uh, the use of the farmland mapping and monitoring program um, and infill threshold um, and what that looks like in rural communities. Qualifying transit and the role of flexible transit because none of us most of the rural communities I know definitely don't have dedicated BRT, let alone or really great bus systems, although some of us do. Um, housing element compliance can pose a specific challenge to our rural communities. Um, and the role of MPOs and the support that they can provide rural communities often looks different in a community that doesn't have an MPO. Next slide, Christine. So with infill development, um, infill in this program is defined um, by a site that is currently developed on 75% or three sides of the project area, project site. It also must be located in an urbanized area. And so how you check this is you would take your project address and you run it through the farmland mapping and monitoring program tool. It will assess whether or not you are in an urbanized area, if the land around you is considered developed or not. One of the considerations here is that the farmland mapping and monitoring tool is a statewide tool that's used across programs. It's not necessarily updated at the same rate as maybe some of our general plans. And when they're looking for actual developed land, they are looking for land that has actually been developed on. It needs to be broken in. It needs to have roads being put in place or buildings on that. Just because it's in a general plan or uh, slated for development down the road will not necessarily qualify here. Um, and so that can raise a lot of issues, a lot of questions, and we'll look site by site, and we will um, help work with any applicant to determine whether or not they are really on what is considered an info site and if it will pass the threshold set by the state. Um, what we'll do is we'll run it, we'll look at it with you, and then we'll hop on a call directly with our partners at SDC and HCD to make sure that that is happening. But because rural communities are disproportionately have more farmland or forest land, um, it, this charge, uh, causes a specific consideration. Also, in a lot of our urban counterparts, we're developing on perfect, neat, tiny, little square lots. Uh, that's not always the case in rural areas. And so that 75% versus three sides took a lot of advocacy and reworking in partnership with HCD to, um, and SGC to get to that place. Um, but that 75% and three sides is pretty specific. And so we will you know, definitely want to look at that. Thanks. Any questions on this? Go ahead and throw them over in the chat and we'll definitely come back to them at the end. Next slide, please. Qualifying transit. So with qualifying transit, as we said, many of our rural communities don't have robust bus systems. Um, and one of the places that this really is helpful, um, this idea of flexible transit. And when we talk about flexible transit, what we really mean here are things like van pools. They're on a, usually they're on a fixed route. They're starting and stopping at regularly scheduled places and they're picking lots of folks up as they go, a minimum of at least two passengers. Many of our programs and projects have been really successful putting in place a flexible transit van school program. Again, we wanna see it operating as much on a fixed route as possible. One of the other key considerations around qualifying transit for our rural projects is that it can, you can use AHSC dollars to build your qualifying transit. So if you don't have the transit infrastructure in place, you can use your AHSC dollars to do that. ICP and POD, you're gonna to need to have some level of transit planned or already in place at the time of application. That's not the case for our rural project. All right. Great. You know what, okay. I do want to jump back because I'm realizing, I realized that there wasn't quite the slide I wanted on net density, and I do want to flag that net density, if we couldn't mind hopping back two slides to, yeah, density. Um, and so a couple of things real quick here. 
15 units to the acre is the threshold requirement. If you come to us with 15 units to the acre, as a TA team, we're gonna try our best to get you to that 20 units to the acre or anything closer. We have had rural projects move forward with 25 units to the acre. One of the considerations here is that this program defines a unit to the acre by that, the unit, the number of units, not the size of your unit, not the number of people living in your unit, it's just the number of units per acre. And there are certain allowable um, exemptions, but things like drainage sites, easements are not necessarily those things. And so in a rural community, there are some specific challenges where if you are a community that's gonna have to have a lot of, like an extra acre of land for your drainage site, or you're having, in general, rural communities have larger units for housing families, we have two, three, four bedroom units, it's still gonna count the same as if you had a studio efficiency unit. So again, flagging that 15 units to the acre, trying to get you that 20 units to the acre. If you show up with four, all four bedroom units, we might work with you to see if we can tear that down to a couple studio units to try to up your density. Again, it's something to flag early on, but it's something that we can overcome and, and really be successful with in the long. In the long. Um, with housing element compliance, I'm realizing we didn't have a full slide for that either. Housing elements are usually done at the county level. If you're a rural community, sometimes you are in on that, sometimes you are not. Often our smaller counties are the folks who are behind. If you let us know early on that you are not in compliance with your housing element, your housing element needs to be in place by time of award. We've had several of our projects where we recognize at time of application that we're not in compliance. We jump right in partnership with HCD to help you get into compliance by the time of award. And then with the MPO engagement, as we flagged earlier, there are many regions that don't have an MPO. The TA team can often step in to provide the support that an MPO might often support other regions. Um, and so we definitely want to flag if you have a relationship with your MPO or if there's not an MPO serving your, your area. Okay, thanks so much for bouncing around with me. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we've been talking about a lot of different things. And if you're a housing developer, you're probably like, whoa, I don't know about transit. Um, who do I talk to about that? So you've probably picked up, this is a program that really integrates partners, focuses on cross-sector partnerships, and you need to be attentive to a lot of factors. Um, so here we've kind of identified the primary partners involved in a successful application um, and what they're typically responsible for. Again, the developer is usually the lead applicant entity. They confer most of the threshold requirements. They project manage the day-to-day -day application needs interface with a variety of consultants. Public agencies are usually deeply engaged in helping scope the bicycle and pedestrian items, providing cost estimates and budgets, sometimes providing mapping assistance, providing backup documentation needed to verify greenhouse gas reductions. Um, public agencies can complete these tasks as either a formal joint applicant or not. There's no impact on competitiveness in how public agencies want to engage with an application. Then we see transit agencies um, lend a lot of assistance. After housing, it's usually transit improvements that really drive down your greenhouse gas reductions. Um, again, can participate as either joint applicants or not. All partners are responsible for carrying out meaningful community engagement, um, but we do recommend that you become familiar with and have conversations with community-based organizations um, to really identify what community needs are and how your project can meet them. Okay, now we're going to transition to discussing what a competitive application looks like. Um, keep in mind, again, this is a very intersectional program. It's housing and transportation. And you can see in this graphic, um, you know, every section with a little, I think that's a trolley or a bike next to it, um, is influenced in some way by your non-housing scope. So ASIC has 100 total points possible. Nobody has yet achieved 100 points, so it's not like other housing programs necessarily. That being said, you do want to achieve the most amount of points you can, and the rubric we're looking at right now is for the largest piece of the scoring section, 55 points, attributable to what is called the quantitative policy section. Um, so again, you can see almost half of those 55 points are tied in some way to your bike pad transit scope, which is why it's so critical to have an application team that includes folks who are knowledgeable and willing to engage in those aspects. 
of the application. I'm going to turn it over to Alicia to talk a little bit about um, the narrative section of the application. So um, if you've never done an ASSC application, uh, the narrative can be a little bit of a surprise. This is not like other applications. The narrative takes substantial planning. It's looking for very, very specific information. We will have um, lots of support for folks who are looking at applying and how to navigate the narrative section. One of the things to understand is that a narrative can break your application. We have seen really great projects either almost or completely not get awarded because they really didn't address the narrative fully. That being said, you have to have gotten through all of the quantitative scoring, um, quantitative scoring to get to the qualitative. So if you can't get all the other threshold pieces in place and the points there, they won't even read your narrative. But once they do, this is a make or break it place. So um, each of these sections is, has really specific information and we will help you to do that. But what we're looking at is collaboration and planning. Really who came together? Again, this entire project is really about comprehensive partnerships that come together to create really catalyzing projects. And again, it's not just housing, it's not just transit, it's really telling the story of the community that you're serving and how this project is going to change that. So the collaboration and planning will tell you specifically who is at the table, how did you engage with your partners to come up with this project? Community benefit and engagement, look specifically at how beyond just providing transit and housing, are you really serving the needs of the community and how did you determine what those needs were? In this section, they're actually gonna to look to say, what community engagement did you do? What information did the community give you? And which part of your project addresses that? How did you take that community engagement and put it into place? Which means you need to start your community engagement long before you get all of your um, project elements finalized and way before you get to this narrative. Don't worry, we can help you with community engagement as well. We have a whole webinar coming up for you soon. Community climate resiliency. This is definitely looking at very specific elements um, in terms of where your project site is, what are the specific climate challenges facing your community, and how does this project specifically address them? Also got lots of support for you on that one, but you can't make it up at the last minute. Community air pollution exposure mitigation is also how we're really addressing if we're gonna be developing housing in these places that we know are already overburdened um, by, with air pollution, how are you going to mitigate that with your project? Again, something you can't leave till the last minute, but something you have lots of support getting you to. Christine, was there anything I left out? No, nope, that was very comprehensive. Again, um, you know, if you work with a TA provider, we will assist you as you're developing this. Okay, so we have narrative worth 15 points, quantitative policy 55 points, that's 70 points. Your last 30 points are attributable to your greenhouse gas quantification. Um, so how far down are you driving those reductions? Remember, we said at the start, ASIC is first and foremost a GHG reduction program. As the applicant, you will need to provide an assessment of your reductions as part of your application. Again, on the TA team, we have greenhouse gas quantification specialists, so they work with you to take the different elements of your project, quantify those reductions. <laughs> the, state, the state is then going to verify these estimates, um, so that's why you definitely want a specialist doing it um, to confirm your total reduction amount. So this is another section, again, heavily influenced by your transportation scope. So 30 points, half of those points are related explicitly to um, the, the extent you're driving down those reductions. So what your final GHG reduction amount looks like. The other half is what we call your efficiency score. Um, so taking the amount of reductions your project is achieving relative to your funding ask. So you don't want a huge funding ask if you're not driving down those GHGs, right? You want to strike a good balance. You want to have good scoping items that really move your GHG reductions down. Again, there's going to be an entirely separate webinar we're hosting in June that looks at all of this very explicitly. If you're interested in knowing kind of the ins and outs, um, we recommend you sign up for that. We'll be sending out information on how to do so um, following this event. Okay, continuing to pick it apart a little bit. Um, your housing project is also a factor in driving down your greenhouse gas amount. Um, and so to maximize these reductions, there are a couple best practices you can, you know, utilize in your housing in. site to Come help in. drive. 
Alicia, I think your your cute little little one is is part of our presentation. He is very cute. Um, so you should focus on one maximizing your site's affordability. Make sure at least twenty percent of your um, units are affordable to, at the deepest level. Maximize your density um, and include that with you know, a commercial component if you can. Oh, that wasn't Alicia, somebody else's little one. <laughs> um, make sure you're muted, guys. Um, dense, so dense housing, uh, again, Alicia, we know that's a challenge as she mentioned, but um, to the extent you can maximize it, pair it with a commercial component. Um, you can get benefit from mixed use status and limit the parking to the extent you can. We really recommend looking at um, at least a one-to-one -one ratio, lower if you can do it. This program will not pay for parking costs. Um, and again, they can help reduce your GHG school, uh, reduction amount. And then focus on, if you can, renewable energy components as part of your housing site. Okay, transportation components. So housing drives GHG reductions, transit drives GHG reductions. Um, the key input to consider when you're thinking about transit is anything that will increase transit ridership. So you want to scope for improvement that will considerably increase that estimate. Just be prepared to stand by the numbers you project, again, because the state is going to verify all of the estimates you put out there um, once your applications are in. Bike and pet pedestrian scoping items also contribute to your GHG reductions. Keep in mind, they contribute considerably less than both the housing and the public transit pieces. You absolutely need them for scoring purposes. Um, and just because, I mean, biking ped is a, a really essential active transportation component of any project, um, but relative to the housing and transit, they're not gonna be your big drivers. Okay, moving into, um, you know, you've got a housing site in mind, but how do you even start to think about this non-housing scope? In order to do that, it's helpful to understand how the program defines your project area to start that scoping conversation. First, you need to make sure your housing site qualifies for the program, again, by ensuring it's at least a half mile from qualifying transit that's there currently or that you're going to bring. So here you can see we've got, this is certainly not a rural, area, San Leandro, but um, your map will look similar. Got your housing site, got your qualifying transit stop. Next, you're gonna put a one mile buffer around your qualifying transit stop. This is your initial project area. Um, you can start scoping items that fall within this buffer. Next, you can also extend your project area beyond that one mile buffer. So here we have a new bike lane and we have a new walkway. This is going to get a little tricky. Um, if you don't have mapping capacity, the TA team will work with you to help you figure out what that looks like. Um, and I hope I don't lose you here. So you've got a new walkway and a new bike lane. They're not within the initial one mile buffer, but you're going to see that because these improvements get their own buffers, which I'm going to show in a second, we can include them and expand our project area. So now we've got half mile buffers around these two STI scoping items that are overlapping with the one mile buffer, which is why we can include them. And then we merge the buffers to create the final project area. This can be important because again, when you're doing your GHG calculations, um, you score better when you have infrastructure improvements that are connecting to different amenities. So maybe out by this green line, there's, you know, a public library and a bank and a grocery store by the blue line, that's where the high school is. Um, you want to be, you know, strategic and meaningful in how you are scoping and citing um, these different elements. Again, we can help you figure out your mapping capacity plan if that is something you're concerned about. Okay. We have a couple minutes left. I'm gonna talk quickly about next steps and then we might have a few minutes to just look at some general Q&A themes in the chat. Remember, we are going to put together um, a comprehensive FAQ document based on all questions submitted. So if you can't stick around for that, um, 
or you didn't get your question answered, we will be responding to it. Okay, ASIC is now on an annual schedule. Um, and this is where we are at currently for round five, the current round. The NOFA comes out in August. So it came out in August 20, not the NOFA, excuse me, draft guidelines. So it came out in August 2020. There's a, you know, a comment period if you have concerns or questions. Final guidelines are adopted in October. The NOFA was released in early November. Applications due in February, awards in June. Um, and I think actually this should say round six. Yes, because this is the um, schedule we will be seeing for the upcoming round. Okay, what does that mean for you as you are working on an application? Right now is really when you want to start a conversation, you have a housing site or you're a public agency, you want to get partners engaged to develop a housing site, um, and you start talking to the different partners to really start thinking about scoping items. By the fall, you want to hopefully have, you know, a draft scope put together. You're really starting your community engagement process. Um, the NOFA comes out, you're making sure you're in contact with all of the players and you're ready to start and focus on the actual application. By the winter time, um, your scope is done, you've got your budget numbers to plug in. That leaves you the remaining two months to really get your narrative in line, you know, finalize your GHG quantification, collect all the necessary attachments. You're gonna submit in February. There's some initial scoring that goes on. You can appeal some of those initial scores if needed. Applications are awarded in June we start all over again. So next step, we recommend you follow up with us. Um, again, we'll be emailing out a lot of information. Our contact information will be included in there. Um, and you talk about applying for technical assistance under the state program. So we can talk to you about what those qualifying factors are. Um, and we go ahead and get going on a project. Um, alternatively, if you didn't meet the state's requirements for whatever reason, reason we can't put you in touch with um, other technical assistance providers do like a fee for service contract or something like that and you know we get ready and we prepare to talk about the next round and with that i'm going to go ahead and open up just the chat for a couple questions. Um, my colleagues at Enterprise and some colleagues at CCRH have been monitoring the chat. So Julia, I'm going to open it up to you. Um, if there are any themes you saw worth highlighting, if you have some last minute questions you didn't get answered yet and you want to drop them in really quickly, go ahead and do so. And then I'm just going to reiterate, we are going to send out this recording. We're going to send out a copy of the PowerPoint and we'll be sending out that FAQ as well as methods to sign up for the next webinar. So with that, I will mute myself and Julia, if there's anything you think is worth highlighting, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so there were just two questions that um, I thought maybe we can spend a little bit of time on. The first one is, um, now that solar is a code requirement, will ASIC require something stricter? And then there was also a question about community engagement at the age of COVID that I was wondering uh, if maybe you had something to add, Christine. So can you read that question to me? I'm going through the chat right now. Sure. The first one? The solar one? Sure. It's um, now that oh. solar is a code requirement, will ASIC require something stricter? So good question. And one we've gotten a lot, we are currently sort of discussing how the state is going to assess um, the new requirements and apply them and whether there will be an incentive to, you know, do something stricter or not. Um, this is probably a question we're going to have to vet with the state, so they'll be reviewing all the FAQ responses and confirming um, that that is a possibility. Currently, the program gives you um, points if you have at least a third of your on-site energy produced by renewable sources um, or maximum points if you have a zero net energy building, so there's a bit of a range. And I think we're going to explore a conversation around how that is changing in the face of the new code requirements. So 
sorry, I don't have a direct answer for you right now, but we will address that. Um, okay, then I see the other question. How do we effectively do community engagement in the age of COVID? That is a great question, one that we were all are all thinking of. Um, you know, typically this presentation would have been an in-person workshop throughout the state, but as that is not currently an option, we're, we're doing it virtually. So we are also talking with SGC and HCD about, um, you know, what, what are some good innovative ways to capture community feedback? Again, we are having a community engagement focused webinar in June that will hopefully start to answer this question. I don't know that anybody right now has you know, a single solution or good answer to that. And we're all trying to figure it out. Um, but I would recommend signing up for that event um, and following up with us if you're not able to make it. And we can sort of start brainstorming on some best practices to share with you. All right. And with that, um, just one quick question from Betsy. Is there an opportunity to comment on the GHG quantification methodology? There absolutely is. Um, ARB is actually hoping to get more feedback on their quantification methodology for their next update. So we will keep you in the loop there, Betsy, um, and folks, everyone on the call. And with that, um, TA providers will be on for a couple more minutes until 2.30 proper. We appreciate all of you tuning in. Again, all of this information will be sent out to you probably sometime next week. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions, you're welcome to email us directly. I'll drop myself and Alicia's emails in the chat. Um, and we appreciate your time today. Have a good rest of your Thursday afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to be um, ending the webinar now. Great. Thanks, Julia. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks.